So good morning and, and thank you for making time to join us today. My name is Kate White. I'm the leader of the Yukon NDP and the MLA for Tikini Copper King. I'm joining you from the traditional territory of the Kwamundun First Nation and the Ta'an Kwachin Council and invite all speakers to acknowledge the traditional territory they're on. With me today are Donna Miller Fry, former superintendent of Jack Holland Elementary School and chief complainant in the RCMP investigation, and Peter Julian, member of parliament for New West Minister Burnaby and sponsor of Bill C-273, which aims to remove section 43 from the Criminal Code of Canada. My federal colleague Donna and I will speak about the abuse of children and about the importance of repealing section 43 from the Criminal Code of Canada. Section 43 reads, every school teacher, parent or person standing in the place of a parent is justified in using force by way of the correction toward a pupil or child as the case may be who is under his care if the force does not exceed what is reasonable under the circumstances. In May of 2022, thanks to pressure from parents and staff, the Department of Education finally admitted that physical punishment had been used for years at Jack Holland Elementary School. They admitted to the use of holds, restraints, and isolation cells as forms of discipline. Children affected could be as young as kindergarten, and some of these children are now grown. These practices are now being investigated by the RCMP and are part of a class action lawsuit against the government of Yukon. This RCMP investigation started because someone spoke out. So we're grateful that Donna Miller Fry reported the abuse to the RCMP once she became aware of the history and the extent of harm to children. It is now understood that senior leadership at the Department of Education was well informed about the physical discipline tactics being used at the school. And before I dive into more details, I wanna say, as with everyone else, we will use the words alleged or allegations when talking directly about the abuse. These allegations are under investigation, under investigation and subject to a lawsuit. That being said, I want to be clear that I believe the victims, I believe the parents, I believe the children, and I believe the staff that have come forward. So this is what we know and why we think it's important to talk about. In 2008, isolation cells were built at Jack Holland Elementary School and a zero tolerance, tolerance disciplinary culture was developed where children would be put in holds followed by solitary confinement for minor actions, such as speaking out in class or refusing to remove a hood. Now this part is very important. This was not done for the safety of students or staff. This was a model for the discipline and punishment of children. Children were allegedly left for hours in solitary confinement, unsupervised, but monitored through a camera. Originally, the isolation cells had glass doors to be able to see the students, but we've learned that those glass doors had to be removed due to children allegedly breaking the glass trying to escape. Now this is a horrific detail to know when reminded that we're talking about an elementary school. Children were taught that they were bad and they were made to believe that they deserved what was being done to them. To the best of our knowledge, these practices stopped in 2020, thanks to a former principal who attempted to make systemic changes at the school. We also know of teachers and staff that have tried to speak out before, we know that staff reached out to the Department of Education for support, for training, for resources, and that the government did nothing. For 12 years, children in a public elementary school were allegedly put into isolation rooms and put in holds as a form of discipline and punishment. Two successive governments, one Yukon party and one liberal government, knew and authorized these practices. It took the liberals four years to put an end to it and two more years to acknowledge that it had happened. And all this time, children and parents were convinced that this was all their fault, that they were bad kids or bad parents. Children were left alone to deal with the trauma, some of them for 12 long years. This is a story of children, parents, and school staff being left alone while the government closed its eyes on systemic abuse. And now that the story has been made public, we're hearing from current and former parents of Jack Holland students. Many of them are desperately trying to find out if their child or children are potential victims. We've heard from them that the Department of Education is refusing to give them the information. On one hand, we have a government that is claiming they're reaching out to all of those affected. And on the other hand, parents are telling us that they're being denied access to documents that would allow them to find out if their children were victims of abuse. In many cases, parents have only found out that their children had been kept in solitary confinement were put in holds at school when they were contacted by the RCMP for interviews as part of this investigation. Instead of fully cooperating with parents, instead of supporting families, the government has left parents, school employees, 
and the Child and Youth Advocates Office to identify and support children who have been abused. Parents have told us that they are left trying to access support on their own or that with the help of school staff that are doing their best without resources from the Department of Education. We're talking about this today because the voices of parents and children matter and because Section 43 of the Criminal Code allows this type of abuse to go unpunished. It is unclear if the RCMP will be able to pursue criminal charges or if criminal charges could eventually be successful as these actions may be protected by Section 43 of the Criminal Code. The NDP are not the only ones calling for the removal of this section. The Truth and Reconciliation Commission called the action number six calls for the repeal of Section 43. And the United Nations themselves have called on Canada to repeal this section. Any law that allows children to be subjected to corporal punishment should be abolished. Violence against children should never be legal. This territory knows firsthand why Section 43 is a dangerous tool that continues to be used against children. It needs to stop. We know that good work is being done by the Jack Holland School community, but they shouldn't have to do this work alone. We call on the Yukon government to truly support parents and children to put all the resources in place for mental health support, administrative support, and support for the school community to move past these traumas. Today, I call on all Canadians to join us in standing up against the abuse of children in schools. Today, I call on the Government of Canada to repeal Section 43 of the Criminal Code. Thank you, and I'll now turn it over to Donna. Thanks so much, Kate. Good morning. Um, I'd like to begin by acknowledging that we live and work in the traditional territory of the Kwanlandan First Nation and the Ton Kwachin Council. My name is Donna Miller Fry. As Kate mentioned, I was the superintendent of schools in the Yukon. I was superintendent for 12 schools in the northern part of the Yukon Territory, including Jack Holland Elementary School and Whitehorse. While I did report to the RCMP regarding the physical abuse of children over decades at the public elementary school, that was just a normal part of superintendent work. In fact, any educator who becomes aware of abuse of children is required to report. I was not the first person to report the abuse. Um, I was not the last person to report the, the abuse. I might just be the most stubborn person to have reported the abuse. Today, I won't be speaking about my time working as a superintendent of Jack Holland Elementary School, but I will be speaking about the last eight months while I've been supporting the families of abused children attempting to navigate a system that is not set up to support them. As Kate said, we use the term alleged physical abuse of children as we enter the 14th month of the RCMP investigation. But in my eight months since leaving the Department of Education, I have spoken to many families about the abuse their children have endured, and I have no reason not to believe them. As well, many of you have heard the documentary CBC did on how the families found out only during RCMP interviews that their children had been subjected to what many have compared to torture, being locked up, screaming for help for hours in a tiny cell. 14 months is a really long time to wait for help for kids who need it now. Remember that these children have been dragged from classrooms for disobedience, put into restraints for hours and forced into isolation. Children have reported being triggered by the sound of walkie talkies, the click of high heels, as these are the sounds of them coming to get me. The Yukon Department of Education has admitted that holds, restraints, and seclusions were routine, routinely used on children at Jack Holland Elementary School prior to 2020 for matters of non-compliance or not following the direction of staff when it should be reserved for a last resort when a staff member or student is in imminent danger. I, I do really want to add at this time that there are several schools in Whitehorse and in the Yukon Territory where staffs are dedicated to trauma-informed approaches to their professional work in ch with children. And in fact, I would say that some of our schools are model schools for anyone wanting to learn how to use a trauma-informed approach to the work. But imagine how shocking it was then to, do, to discover a public school where the Jack Holland Way demanded precise and immediate compliance with any teacher demands with the threat of corporal punishment if children did not listen the first time. Until very recently, the Hawk Code of Conduct was posted in every classroom, and the W in Hawk stands for will listen the first time. 
It's important to note that Section 36 of the Yukon Education Act prohibits corporal punishment. The Yukon government admitted two years of corporal punishment of children, yet in the deputy minister's own words in her interview with CBC in May, no operational or staffing changes have been made in response to these findings. Trauma is what happens inside of us when we're harmed or exposed to danger. It changes our future reactions and it can cause us to react and respond in ways that are not proportional to the size of the threat as the survival mode is on the lookout for anything that's threatening or unsafe. Trauma responses can't be turned on and off, harming children even further because they don't conform with adult demands only makes the situation worse. So we have two priorities right now. The first priority was read by Kate White in the Yukon Legislative Assembly on November 23rd, asking the government of Yukon to direct parents and families of current and former Jack Holland uh, Elementary School students to where they can find information on whether or not their child was subjected to holds and seclusion. Any Department of Education in Canada is fully aware of the serious long-lasting impacts of trauma inflicted by educators at Jack Holland Elementary. The Yukon Department of Education should be urgently, urgently seeking the victims of abuse and ensuring that every single harmed child has the professional support needed to ensure full healing from what has been done to them. This, is a, this right to healing is enshrined in the Article 39 on the Convention of the Rights of the Child. And secondly, we have to make sure this never happens to another child. The prohibition of corporal punishment in the Yukon Education Act was not enough to prevent this archaic and harmful approach to school management. The Convention on the Human Rights of the Child was not enough to prevent the physical and mental trauma inflicted on children in the school. During open public school council meetings, Jack Holland elementary teachers and leaders have expressed with confidence that they have done nothing wrong and that they have the right to use force on children to drag them out of classrooms and restrain them as a form of punishment under section 43 of the criminal code. They have a defense for this behavior. When we know better, we do better. So let this never be a reason why teachers, principals and educational assistants think they have the right to harm a child ever again. We need to be really, really clear. It's not okay to hurt children. And this message will only be clear when we repeal section 43 of the criminal code. Thank you. Peter, I will just ask you to unmute, please. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nina. My name is Peter Julian. I'm the member of parliament for New Westminster Burnaby and the NDP house leader. And I'm speaking to you from the traditional unceded territory of the Anishabi Algonquin nation. I, I wanted to thank Donna Miller Fry for her strong advocacy for, for children. And I wanted to thank Kate White for being such a, a powerful voice in the Yukon legislature and for standing up for Yukon families and for the children of the Yukon. Uh, I uh, have put forward a private member's bill, Bill C-273. And the intent of the bill is to remove, repeal section 43 of the criminal code, uh, which uh, allows for the legal use of force against children. We've heard the horrific allegations of Jack Holland Elementary School. And the reality is, as long as we have a criminal code that permits the use of force against children, we will sadly see other examples across the country of the use of force. It is, as uh, Ms. Miller Fry has indicated, that what it does is provide basically cover uh, for the use of force uh, for physical coercion of children. More than 60 countries across the world have banned uh, the physical punishment of children. And, and Canada has been a laggard internationally compared uh, to many of our friends and allies around the world. And we know from the Truth and Reconciliation Commission and the calls to action number six, the importance of repealing section 43, yet that has not happened. And so today uh, the federal NDP uh, joins its voice uh, to, uh, to Kate White and many 
uh, in the Yukon who are saying that it is time now to repeal Section 43 and eliminate that legalized use of force against children. It is in line with truth and reconciliation recommendations. It is in line with international practices. And when we think of the the genocide that took place at residential schools and the horrific allegations coming out even recently around Jack Holland Elementary School, it is high time that the Canadian government took the act, the work has already been done, and uh, ensure that we repeal Section 43. Alors, ça m'a fait plaisir d'être ici avec uh, uh, le chef uh, du MPD au Yukon, Kate White, et Donna miller Fry, qui est vraiment un, un avocat uh, uh, pour, pour le droit des, des enfants au Yukon, pour parler justement de, de enlever uh, la protection qui est donnée dans le code criminel présentement par la section 43, qui légalise l'usage de la force physique contre les, les enfants. Uh, quand on regarde les allégations qui sont sorties dernièrement uh, à l'école élémentaire Jack Holland de Whitehorse, il, il est évident que c'est maintenant le temps qu'on élimine toute ambiguïté et qu'on enlève cette section qui permet uh, l'usage de la force contre les enfants. Le, les commissions sur le, la vérité et la réconciliation dans son, ses appels à l'action. On dit dans le numéro 6 qu'il fallait effectivement enlever cette section-là. Et quand on regarde la pratique au niveau international, il y a plus qu'une soixantaine des pays qui ont déjà enlevé cette euh, permission qui est donnée pour l'usage des forces contre les enfants. Alors, c'est le temps d'agir. Le gouvernement a déjà tout le travail fait pour eux. Euh, le projet de loi est là. Et c'est maintenant le temps au gouvernement fédéral de, de prendre ses responsabilités, de cesser juste de tourner en rond et de parler de quelque chose qu'il faut faire et il faut agir justement pour enlever cette section du code criminel et enlever euh, toute permission, toute pratique, toute légalisation de l'usage des forces contre les enfants. Merci. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much. So now we'll go to questions from media. So I will ask media if you if you have a question to please use the raise hand function. And when we call on you, please identify your please tell us your name and identify your media outlet. Alors pour tous les médias qui sont ici aujourd'hui, si vous avez une question, je vous invite à utiliser la fonction lever la main pour poser votre question. Juste identifier vous identifier et identifier votre média. So uh, I will go ahead and let. Uh, I can only see Simone on the on on the list here. So if you can just tell us uh, what media outlet you're from and go ahead with your question. I'm assuming that you meant uh, me, Peter Zimonich, um yes. from CBC. Yeah. Okay. Great. Um, uh, thank you uh, for for doing this today. Um, uh, the press conference uh, suggests or outlines some what sound like absolutely horrible conditions um, of abuse in in the Yukon um, as the justification uh, for removing Section 43. But the uh, Supreme Court of Canada ruled in, in 2004 that um, that physical punishment of a child has to come with a number of um, constraints or limits, all of which it seems um, uh, that happen in the Yukon fall outside those limits. For example, teachers can separate children or restrain them briefly, but they can't confine them to a room strapped down for hours. Um, any physical force has to be fleeting. It has to be directed at a child for the purposes of correcting a behavior. It can't be extreme. It can't hit them in the head. You can't cause physical harm. You can't degrade them. All of these things were laid out in the Supreme Court's 2004 ruling on how reasonable force should be measured when these cases are brought to court. So what I'm questioning is why would repealing uh, this this ruling change anything about that behavior uh, in the Yukon when that was already against the law as it stands now? Hello? Well, I'll, I'll certainly start, and, and I'm, I'm sure uh, Kate and Donna will have uh, things to add. I mean, the reality is you're talking about a Supreme Court decision that tries to provide a framework around the legalized force against children that is contained within the criminal code. I think it's very clear that no matter how many Supreme Court decisions that you have that try to provide a framework uh, or direction around the use of force, 
there is no doubt that the presence of Section 43 condones the use of force, accepts the use of force. Um, the conditions around that, uh, I, I would suggest, are, are less important than the fact that, that uh, there is that clause in the criminal code clearly says that the use of force against children is permitted. And, and that is why more than 60 countries have uh, done a similar action outlawed in their criminal code, the use of force against children to remove all ambiguity. Uh, so my argument would be that what we saw at the allegations at Jack Holland School that are serious come about the come about as a as a result of the ambiguity that exists right now, where the criminal code says the use of force is permitted. And yes, the Supreme Court may have tried to put a framework around that, but the reality is, as long as the use of force is permitted, these things will continue to happen. And that is why it's so important, as other countries have found, to repeal. Uh, any sections of, of criminal codes that, that permit the use of force against children. If I, I can just add something as well, and I'm not a lawyer, not pretending to be, um, I'm an educator. And one of the challenges around this is that we are not looking at anything that happens prior to the punishment or the use of physical uh, harm to children. When we think about a trauma-informed approach, we recognize that children are arriving in school, sometimes with an emotional age that does not align with their chronological age. And that requires a very different approach as an educator to help build skills, teach self-regulation, um, and, and, and build the ability of, of the child to exist in the school environment uh, because they're coming to us quite often with past trauma. The law right now only talks about the moment when physical intervention is used. It doesn't consider uh, what we know as educators as being best practice in helping children never reach the point where physical intervention would even be needed. And so that's one of my concerns is it does not inform uh, really great practice. And we know so much more about brains and development now than we did in the past. We we have some really great strategies and there are schools here in the Yukon that are demonstrating the use of those uh, strategies all the time so that children never reach the point where they're escalated, where we provide them opportunities to use self-regulation and we teach them the skills that they need um, to recognize in their own bodies when they need to take a break or, or do something else so they don't reach that that point. And so that's one of my concerns as an educator that none of that is addressed in, in that section of the criminal code. Could I, could I just um, push, push back against Mr. Julian's comments about, um, uh, about the criminal code? It, it, it Just from a logical point, it, it seems if the criminal code says something is illegal, which the criminal code does in this case, the Supreme Court has ruled that certain actions are illegal and people decide to go and do those certain actions anyway. It seems like that's an enforcement issue and not a make the law stronger issue, because if they're not obeying the law in the first instance, what's the point in doing Section 43 is what I'm trying to get at. Um, if, if the Supreme Court and the law lays out these um, constraints around behavior and people ignore those constraints, I don't see how just passing a further law without some kind of enforcement makes any difference. And I'm, I'm trying to connect those two. Well, I, I, I don't want to get in a debate with you, of course, um, it, I, I would suggest that 60 countries have, have very clearly indicated that repealing laws that permit the use of force against children uh, are, are fundamental. And that's why 60 countries have done it. And I think that's more a, a question that I would put back to you. Why have more than 60 countries outlawed the use of force? Uh, very clearly then, both being clear in terms of their criminal codes, but also uh, being clear in, in being clear so that enforcement can take place. Uh, and why has Canada lagged behind? And and that is why uh, I, I think this bill is receiving so much support from across the country, from uh, uh, advocates for children, for organizations. Uh, it also responds for the Tre Tooth and Reconciliation Commission that calls to action number six. And why would the commission have put forward that as one of its most important calls to action if they did not feel that it would make a difference? So I, rather than having the debate over whether a Supreme Court judgment is sufficient, I would prefer that uh, 
that really the debate take place on why other countries have acted differently than Canada, why the Truth and Reconciliation Committee Commission clearly called for repeal of Section 43, and why it has not been done, when very clearly there is a need for it. Thank you very much. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Sorry, I just wanted to add one more point. The Centers for Disease Control in the States have done research on when um, legislative approaches to corporal punishment are removed and how it does decrease uh, harm to children. And I'm happy to send you that research if you're interested. Thank you very much. Merci beaucoup. We'll go to the next question. Jim Elliott with Yukon News. Please go ahead and unmute. Uh, hello there. Uh, can you hear me all right? Yes. Sorry. Um, yes, it's uh, Jim Elliott from the Yukon News. Um, I, I was just uh, wondering, to the knowledge of any of the speakers, is this the first time that a bill to repeal Section 43 has been introduced in the House? Uh, it, it has. It is the first time in in recent memory. Uh, Libby Davies, who was uh, uh, the NDP House leader uh, a decade ago, had also introduced similar legislation. It was it was not passed. Uh, I think the impetus uh, today is much much stronger, both because of the the revelations of genocide at residential schools, uh, the e e egregious horrific allegations coming out of Jack Holland School. I would suggest the political context uh, is makes it uh, uh, an even bigger imperative uh, now than it was then. Uh, do, do, do you have any uh, information as to why that failed um, when it was previously introduced in in the House? Was it just a, a lack of you know sort of bipartisan support, as you said, it was uh, introduced by the NDP? Uh, it 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 there this was. Uh, during uh, the era of um, the conservative governments, and there was uh, no support within the conservative government for for this uh, this action, and 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 so I think it's fair to say, uh, again, the political context today, the allegations we're hearing from Jack Holland School, the revelations over the last few years of the genocide at residential schools. Uh, these these have created momentum, and I, I would suggest that there is a broad level of political support across the country for this. Uh, now it is up to the government and parliament to act, and I certainly hope that uh, this happens. Work will continue. The, the NDP will continue to push uh, this bill in the House of Commons, but I am much more confident that the right thing will be done with, with the right pressure from the public. Uh, than may have been the case a decade ago. Thank you very much. Merci beaucoup. We'll go to the next question. Jackie Hong with the CBC Yukon. Please go ahead. Hi there. Can you hear me okay? Yes, perfect. Great. Um, I actually have two questions. The uh, first one I'll direct at uh, Kate and Donna. Um, I guess for Kate, when did the Yukon NDP first become aware of the allegations at Jack Holland? And then for both Kate and Donna, um, you've mentioned staff who say they believe they were doing the right thing and um, the school, the tense school council meetings. I'm sure you're aware that some parents are of the position that the quote real story here is the issues that started at Jack Holland after 2020. Uh, what do you say to those parents and that part of the community? Donna, I'll go first and, and I'll let you follow up. Uh, so uh, the I think the first public like the first real public information about what was happening in Jack Holland um, was in, in May of this year with the CBC article. Um, but I had been supporting uh, families trying to relocate kids from schools. Um, and at that point in time, they didn't even really understand what was happening or why the behavior with their kids had changed. Um, and so I, I, I was supporting them and trying to, to relocate schools. Um, and then and then the pieces started to fall in place. Uh, Donna approached me um, and and shared what she knew and and um, uh, and and said like we need I, we need help. We don't like we, this needs to move forward. Um, with with that conversation, I, I I followed up with both the RCMP and the Child and Youth Advocate uh, and le learned more. 
Then, of course, uh, the, the story was broken wide open when uh, when Jim Tucker was on uh, on local radio uh, talking about the class action lawsuit against Yukon government. Um, and and so it, it's it, it, it's been it's been a it's been a little while um, and longer while. But I didn't know the cause because when I was working on, on supporting those families to, to relocate their kids, they didn't know the cause. Um, and and now understanding where or how those families were in those positions is, is, is definitely been a, a hard, it, like it's been hard. It's been hard for, um, well, incredibly hard for families and individuals and, 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 and educators. Um, again, uh, it's important to note that um, this wasn't, this wasn't every teacher in Jack Holland. This wasn't every person in that school. And, and, uh, and many, uh, many didn't have any involvement or, or, or even in some cases knowledge. So, um, yeah, it's uh, it's been a challenging a challenging thing to unwrap for sure. Hi, Jackie. Thanks for the question, and I just wanted to recognize the really remarkable work that you did in the the uh, CBC documentary on the current on, on this. So, thank you very much for um, giving the families a, a voice through that uh, through that opportunity. Um, I just concur with what uh, Kate said. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, I'm not speaking about anything from the time I was superintendent at Jack Holland, so I'm just going to speak in generalities. Um, when a school uses a cultural approach where um, compliance and, and disciplinary measures are, are um, the strategy that is, is used, uh, it's challenging to just switch that on a dime. Right. And so when you think about somebody coming in and not wanting physical abuse of children to continue, uh, shifting a culture at school is very, very difficult. And I can state from minutes at public school council meetings um, that are available to you uh, in March and April of 2021 in the principal's report, you'll see that the principal was trying very hard to use the growth mindset approach and a trauma informed practice approach um, to shift the thinking about how we work with all children who arrive in our elementary schools. Um, and you can read through the, the work that she was doing there, but it was not, um, and you'll see in the, the May uh, uh, meeting minutes that it was not a widely accepted approach, that uh, it was a very difficult culture uh, to, to shift at a school. And so when we think about a trauma-informed approach, and um, if you want a real, some really great examples of that, we have a couple of schools in Whitehorse that I would consider to be model schools, where we think about behavior of children as communication and we um, take an inquiry stance uh, for, as a as an educator around what's happening in the brain of a, of a child when they start to escalate. We think about our own co-regulation with children and what we're doing as a result. And so when a child dysregulates in a classroom or in on school property, um, there's a number of things that we then follow up with. And, and one of them is to certainly inform the family and parents and to see what's happening with the child. But secondly, we consider as the grown-ups and the professionals in the school, what actions we took that might have caused that child to dysregulate. And we also think about um, uh, what, what we need to put in place in terms of learning and skills that that child needs to recognize their own signals in their own body about how dysregulation is happening and give them opportunities to self-regulate. So there is a whole body of understanding around trauma-informed approach that um, uh, was attempted to be uh, in, instilled in the school and, and, and wasn't a popular uh, approach, let's just say. And so thinking about what we know as educators now and our capacity to work very differently with children, particularly those from families with intergenerational trauma and how we approach uh, children that arrive with uh, lots of challenges that we need to meet, um, also takes uh, support uh, for, for the school and opportunities for um, all of the educators in the school to learn a very different approach to uh, how we uh, educate children today. Jackie, you want to go ahead with your follow-up? Yeah, uh, this one's for Peter. So uh, I'm wondering if you have ever heard of anything like this happening at any other school in Canada and were the allegations at Jack Holland uh, becoming public the main trigger for introducing this bill uh, alongside with the Truth and Reconciliation Commission? Um, and if so, is this kind of a big step repealing a section of the criminal code just because of allegations at this one school in Whitehorse? Uh, first off, the bill... Uh Predates the emergence of the allegations at the school. 
Uh, secondly, the, the genocide that took place uh, at residential schools has been the, the primary impetus, uh, particularly the revelations over the last few years uh, to, to having the bill put forward. Um, but the reality is, and I, I insist on this, Canada is behind laggard, uh, as a laggard behind the rest of the world. Uh, in, in terms of, of democratic countries, um, the vast majority have eliminated any provisions in their criminal code that legalize the use of force against children. And so if more than 60 countries, uh, almost exclusively democratic countries choose to do that, the question is why Canada is, is such a laggard and so far behind. Uh, and tragically, we, we have the allegations from Jack Holland. We will have allegations from other schools. I am convinced of that for as long as there is ambiguity around the use of force against children, regardless of Supreme Court decisions that provide some kind of framework around it. We will continue, uh, sadly, to hear of these incidences and allegations, and uh, many of these allegations will be horrific. So Canada has to move and act the way other countries have, and, and move to without any ambiguity at all, ensure that the use of, of force against children is, is no longer condoned in our criminal code. Thank you very much, merci beaucoup. Uh, just one last uh, call if there's any questions to use the raise hand function. I have a question from Sarah. Sarah, please go ahead. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, perfect. Um, my question is in French, actually, for um, Peter, so if you don't mind, I'm just wondering, so the bill has been tabled in May, we're now in December. What has evolved, what has changed? Where are we at in the house right now? Uh, well, I'll, I'll answer in English first and then French. Uh, it is at the uh, second reading. Uh, we are getting support from uh, across the country. So uh, uh, I think it's fair to say gathering momentum around that. Uh, the government has not chosen yet. The government always has the ability with the private members legislation once the work is done uh, to incorporate it into its legislation. The government has not chosen to do that thus far. Uh, and there has not been a vote on the legislation either. So at this point, I would suggest in, in the public mind, there's a growing momentum. The government is not has not chosen to act. And I, I would suggest the pressure hasn't been strong enough yet to get them to act. And that, that's why I, I, I think this this press conference today is important as part of developing that that pressure from from parents, from advocates for children across the country, from uh, leaders in our community like Kate White, all standing together and saying it's time to get this legislation passed, it will be helpful to, to finally achieving that. Uh, alors, le, pour, pour, présentement, le projet de loi C-273 est euh, au deuxième lecture à la Chambre des communes. Et le gouvernement, pour l'instant, n'a pas choisi d'incorporer la législation qui, qui existe déjà, le projet de loi existe déjà. Il n'a pas choisi de, de mettre en place ce uh, projet de loi. Alors, euh, qu'est-ce qu'on voit quand même? C'est une augmentation du momentum d'appui un peu partout au Canada. Euh, des parents, euh, des, des gens qui militent pour le droit des enfants, bien sûr aussi les leaders dans, dans nos communautés, euh, comme Kate White. Euh, je pense que le momentum de pression commence à faire de plus en plus fort. Et j'espère bien que le gouvernement va agir euh, suite à toutes ces allégations horrifiques. Euh, selon tout notre passé aussi, en tant que pays, il faut vraiment que le Canada rejoigne les 60 autres pays du monde, surtout les démocraties qui ont dit non, le code criminel ne devrait pas sanctionner, euh, laisser euh, euh, permettre euh, la le, le force physique contre les enfants. Sarah, aurais-tu une question de suivi? Oui. Uh, question for Kate White, and if it's possible, same thing to have an answer in French as well. Um, I'm just wondering if there's like other steps that could be taken to force the government to give uh, family access to the document you're asking for. 
Um, à ce moment, le problème, c'est qu'on on, on imagine que le gouvernement du Yukon ferait toutes les choses qu'on a besoin de supporter les familles, mais ça n'arrive pas. Alors, j'ai demandé dans l'Assemblée, je sais, j'ai fait des entrevues comme celui-ci, um, et je suis toujours en support des, des familles uh, et, et des, um, des bureaux qui, sont en, qui supportent les, les familles aussi. Um, alors, le problème, ce, ce fois-ci, qu'on a un gouvernement qui nous dit une chose. Alors, il, il nous dit qu'ils sont en, en train de supporter les familles, que toutes les, les, les actions arrivent pour, pour les supporter. Mais qu'est-ce qu'on en, en, entend des, des familles? C'est que ça n'arrive pas. Alors, on sait déjà qu'il y a des familles qui, qui veulent savoir si leur, leurs enfants ont été abusés à l'école, mais ils n'ont pas, euh, pas accès à l'information. Um, alors, à, à ce point-ci, moi, 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 je dirais que la, la, pro, la, pro, la, la problème, ça, ça reste avec le gouvernement. Um, alors, c'est pourquoi aujourd'hui, j'ai demandé qu'ils ils, ils ils prennent toutes les actions qu'ils ont besoin pour supporter les enfants, les, les familles qui sont affectées par, um, uh, par, ces, par ces événements. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much. I don't see any more questions. Je ne vois plus de questions. Donc, ceci conclut notre conférence de presse. This concludes our press conference. Thank you. Merci. Bye-bye.